Hello, my name is John Brink and we are podcasting on the brink from downtown. Prince George, the capital of Northern BC, an absolute fabulous day in Northern British Columbia. And for all those people from around the world that are watching our podcast, it's Prince George is the center of British Columbia, an absolute unbelievable place. Uh, all the nature all around us. If you're planning a holiday, include Canada, include British Columbia and include Northern British Columbia. Today, a special guest, a entrepreneur in the making, I believe, and a, f- a fellow that I've known for a little bit and, uh, uh, and has been around Prince George for a long time. So we'll get him to tell us all about it. Garrett. Thanks welcome. for having me, John. Yeah. Welcome to the Appreciate show. Appreciate it. Yeah, so Prince George, born and raised myself. Um, I've been here, yeah, 33 years. Did move away for five years, and then uh, I'm back spending most of my time in Prince George. So it was interesting to to move and then come back, right? So um, where were you when you moved? So I moved to Terrace, British Columbia for... To Terrace? Yeah, for just over five Why years. Why Terrace? Bought a company out that way. Okay. So, um, yeah, I had to sort of uh, amalgamated into our practice here and we're, I'm part of kind of a bigger team with an office in uh, Prince George, of course, Terrace, Kitimat, and then Whitehorse as well. And which, which, what is the company's name? So Asante Wealth Management is uh, the dealer who we work with. Okay. And that's the sort of national brand that people That might... is the umbrella. Exactly, yeah. But we bought a company called Oracle Financial Services uh, January 1st of 2018. And that was in Terrace? Correct. And, and so, and, and Oracle is also financial services? That's right, yeah, yeah. So and we do personal uh, financial planning and wealth management. Yeah, yeah. And, and so tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, you know, you see financial services companies, but you never quite know. Uh, I know some of them that have doing financial uh, uh, help in some form or fashion and that do insurance possibly in some other cases, but does it all include like an Oracle? Yeah, so it's a pretty broad term, right? When you say finance or insurance, right. it's, it's quite broad. Um, our goal is to provide holistic wealth management solutions for uh, Canadian families and businesses, right? So we right. work with all types of different clients, um, you know, from the, from the smaller clients to larger, you know, uh, institutional clients. And we just try to be a one-stop shop for our clients, right? right. So uh, I have my certified financial planning designation. It's a professional designation, much like a lawyer and accountant would have. Where did you get your training? So the, the training for the certified financial planning designation, uh, a lot of it's done online. There's okay. some coursework. Um, I did it back in 2019. That's when I got my designation. There's a couple of proficiency exams. Um, okay. But yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's the designation, I think, that should be sort of the gold standard in the industry. Right. I think that if you're a financial advisor, um, you should either have that designation or be striving to achieve it, right? Right. I think it provides the the knowledge, skills, and abilities for an advisor to deal with more complex financial situations okay. and provide more sound advice, I would say. Okay. And, yeah. and does it include financial services means investment by the average individual in terms of their personal portfolio? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we deal with um, individual personal accounts from things like RSPs to TFSAs non-registered accounts, and then we also uh, deal with insurance as well. So when I say insurance, I'm talking about life accident and sickness insurance. Okay. So um, even group benefits, uh, that type of a thing, right? So yeah, so we're just dealing with, trying to deal with all facets of an individual's financial life, right? Right. We also have a mortgage division as well, uh, where we have a team of mortgage brokers. So we're just trying to provide you know, all different facets of, of finance to an individual. So they can just come to one place and deal with a team of professionals for anything finance related. So that is Oracle and they are in Terrace, Prince George. Well, 
Yeah, so actually Oracle Financial Services was the company that we purchased. Right. That was in Terrace and Kitimat, where we have an office. Okay. But Asante Wealth Management would be our kind of umbrella okay. company that uh, that most people will will identify with. Okay, yeah. okay. And now, so for yourself, you the born in Prince George. Born and raised here, yeah. Born and raised, and then you want to school here you, did you go to the university here i did actually yeah so my progression i i went through the the public school system here in prince george my first job was actually just across the street at the keg i was 15 years old and i was a bus boy there had some odd jobs as i was growing up worked at a cafe and delivered pizza and then um yeah, out of high school, I, uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I originally thought I wanted to maybe move to a bigger center like Vancouver. Yeah. But I ended up getting a job with a local drilling company here, Geotech Drilling, who's actually become quite large now. And uh, a year and a half of that, and that's what kind of sent me back to post-secondary. I realized that wasn't for me. It was an interesting experience. I got to work all over BC and Alberta, right. um, doing some really neat drilling work, but uh, realized that I would prefer a desk job. And yeah. so I went back to school and studied finance and marketing at UNBC. Yeah. So d you did that at UNBC? That's right. Yeah. And then you graduated from there? That's right. Yeah. So I was I was at UNBC from 2009 to 2013. Okay. And it's kind of interesting. I was I was thinking about all the advisors that we have in, as part of our team, and I think out of ten advisors, seven of them went to UNBC. Yeah. So it's a great university. Isn't it amazing what that has how it has changed yeah. Northern British Columbia? Absolutely. I mean, it's uh, it's been around for just over 25 years now. I think. Yeah. Right. They just yeah. had their you had their 25th year anniversary and crazy to think about you know like the the, the queen came up for the for the opening exactly. and yeah it's a it's a stellar university i never i never thought i'd wanted to stay in prince george you know you grow up in a, in a town like this your whole life you think okay there's got to be something bigger and better yeah. out there right yeah and i always thought that okay i would maybe move down to Kelowna or vancouver get get into a bigger center but i did a year up at unbc and I got involved in a program called JDC West, which is a business case competition. Okay. So it's, is that connected to, is that standalone kind of It's a an course? extracurricular okay. uh, yeah, program. And it's for business and economic students. Um, actually, technically, I think any student can compete, but it's an interesting format. So the way that the JDC West case competition works is you're provided with uh, a case a yeah. case study, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. on a, a real business that they've just changed the names and, and yeah, things yeah. on. And you have a team of three individuals. You're kind of locked in a room with no real resources. You get a computer and with yeah, yeah. things like Excel and, and, uh, yeah. and um, PowerPoint, right, to create a presentation. But effectively, what you have to do is in three hours, you need to read, solve the case, create recommendations and a presentation on how you would... Um, deal with this with this real life business case yeah and then after the three hours is up you walk to a presentation room where you then have to present your your PowerPoint yeah. uh, to a panel of judges and the presentation must be at minimum se uh, 18 minutes yeah and then at, at maximum 20 minutes because they'll cut you off and they here. ask you difficult questions yeah so so you do your presentation and then the panel of judges will grill you on why you why you're making that recommendation and it's yeah. it's very interesting because you know it teaches you to to think on your feet it teaches you crit you know critical thinking skills and and presentation skills as well i mean like i much like yourself was pretty nervous to speak in front of you know a big audience right but this is this is the best way to learn is to really just dive right in right yeah. and so i think that you know being involved in that program all four years of my university career is what kind of kept me here. Yeah. And it was just such a, such a great program to be involved in outside of like school life, right? Yeah, so you yeah. still had your coursework, but then yeah. this was on the Th side. That's why it is so important, uh, Garrett, to do those kind of programs because it is out of the ordinary and it tests your ability on, on, uh, and it challenges you as an individual yeah. to solve problems and issues, right? Absolutely, for sure. And, and to become a good communicator. A hundred percent, yeah. And that's where I learned a lot of those very valuable skills that I can use in business today, and right? And still are helpful to you today. Of course, yeah. yeah.
because there's a lot of thinking on your feet and, and uh, communication is so key in, in our business, right? Yeah, that's why I talk about in some of my presentations that I do is that, uh, you know, the, uh, I think uh, in 1990, I was 50 years old, was not very good at communicating, had, mm -hmm. uh, was not very confident, felt, didn't feel comfortable myself in, in talking to any group more than three or four people made me feel uncomfortable and, yeah. uh, you know, and then I joined Toastmasters and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I was a member of Toastmasters for 10 years and then became the, the highest recognized level in Toastmasters is a distinguished Toastmaster. And, and I, uh, you know, became a distinguished Toastmaster. Less than 1% of Toastmasters get to that level. Wow. And, uh, but it, is, it changed my life for all intents and purposes. And I could not do what I'm doing now. Uh, yeah. That includes, uh, you know, I'm also a professional speaker and, and speak on a number of occasions. Yesterday I gave a keynote presentation actually at uh, TACLA and, uh, right. you know, and, uh, and, and, uh, and have done several other ones. And then, uh, you know, so it it's makes such a difference uh, of having that ability, but you need it on a daily, daily basis. You know, Absolutely. I think, you know, in a lot of business, it's, it's important to have solid communication skills and, and like say critical thinking skills, yeah. right? So yeah, it was, a, it was a great program to be involved in all four years that I was up at UNBC. And I'm, yeah. you know, I'm glad I did that, um, you know, in addition to my studies, because I wouldn't, I don't think I would be where I am today without that. Yeah. And I, you know, I got to travel all over Canada and compete at these things and, and the people that you meet uh, are, you know, you build lifelong friendships that way, right? So, yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. So, uh, so Oracle is still an operating business as well then in Terrace and Kitimat? Or? Absolutely, yeah. And yeah. I split my time uh, between Prince George, Terrace and Kitimat. And I actually, uh, from time to time, go up to our Whitehorse office as well. So. Yeah. So Whitehorse, why Whitehorse? Uh, it was just, there was a practice up there that my uh, business partners, Ted Brown and Steve Chadwick, uh, acquired. Geez, I think it's got to be about eight or nine years ago now. Yeah. And yeah, it's just become part of our, our bigger team. So collectively, uh, I think we've got 10 advisors, countless support staff, uh, and then we manage over half a billion dollars in assets. Yeah, uh, yeah, between all the companies. Yeah, for and for clients all over Canada, to be honest. I mean, yeah. with uh, with the pandemic, the amount of Zoom meetings that I'm doing with clients, you know, it's right. uh, we can do so much these days over the phone and and by video conference, and we're using DocuSign for signatures and that type of thing. So it's it's yeah. very neat, especially in the last five years, the use of technology in in our practice to make things just so much simpler. Right? Yeah. Now, another thing that I noticed that you were also selected as the, uh, uh, they have something here, the executives are in, uh, in, 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 in going through their careers, uh, 40 under 40 entrepreneurs of people that are working the path towards their career, and you were selected as one of them. Yeah, yeah, pretty cool honor actually. Um, so I never, I never thought of myself as much of an entrepreneur necessarily. I mean, I took the course in at UNBC and I did find it very interesting. But it wasn't until we bought Oracle Financial Services that I was sort of put into that role where you now you own a business and you're right. dealing with all different facets of it, right? Every day of the week. Yeah, and it's, you know, the ebbs and flows of, of running yeah. a business, as I'm sure you're well, well aware. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you get sort of submerged into that environment, there's so much that you learn. And I, I of course, I value my, my Bachelor of Commerce degree that I got from UNBC, but yeah. nothing will ever prepare you for the, the real life business no. world and all of the challenges that come with running a, a small business, right? Right. So... Yeah, it's um, it's pretty neat to have been able to do that, and like I say, I think I've I learned more in the last five years just running that that company than yeah. I than I have yeah 
in, in my whole life, right? So yeah. it's, it's pretty neat. I did want to, you know, ask you about the challenges that you've had to deal with because you, your story is very interesting. Like I've, I've read both your books. I actually listened to the, the audio book of the ADHD yeah. um, Unlocked. Uh, just I, I think maybe I, to a degree, have a little bit of ADHD and I, I have a very difficult time sitting down and just reading a book for hours, right? So yeah. I find my mind wanders. So uh, so I listened to the audio book, but, um, but I mean, your story is phenomenal uh, to, to come here. Have you read the other one that I have, Against All Odds? Yep, yep, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and I'm going to just show them here to the ones that you're talking about. Yeah. So, the, uh, so for our, our guest, the, uh, Against All Odds, uh, you know, the, uh, was interesting, and as you have read it, and, uh, you know, the, I always say it took me 80 years to live it, 20 mm -hmm. years to think about it, two years to write it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then it's an autobiography, and it's not so much that it is hurrah, hurrah, John Awelli did, but more about in spite of it all, mm -hmm. and all the, uh, you know, falling down, standing up, getting... <laughs> yeah, the trials and tribulations of going Ex through all that, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so they, and, and so that, that's what it really is all about. And then the other thing about uh, an autobiography is that, you, you can't write it, and I started about four, five, six times over that 20 years mm -hmm. to st take, you know, to, to write it, but then at, other things happened and that didn't happen then. So it was about three years ago or so, four years ago, maybe now, uh, that, uh, you know, I said, uh, yeah, if I don't do it now, it will not happen. For sure. So, and, and it's also so with an Against All Arts and an autobiography is you can't write it and then say, hmm, that didn't work so well. So let's do another one. Yeah. Once you do it, that's the one, right? Yeah. Now, the other one that has a direct connection to it and the one that you're referring to is ADHD Unlocked. And, uh, you know, the, it took me probably... I was not very good in school. I failed grade three. Uh, mm -hmm. Who failed grade three? Th grade seven, three times, and uh, didn't really know what I. A lot of times, I felt I had failed, mm -hmm. and uh, because in Holland the way it works is, uh, if you want to build a career, the first thing you say, okay, well, show me your diplomas. Yeah. Well, I didn't have any diplomas, and yeah. uh, and then the other part of it is just that uh, you know we were liberated by the Canadians April the twelfth, nineteen forty-five. Made such an impression on me that I wanted to you know that was my dream from five years forward. I wanted to go to the land of my heroes in uh, Canada. I always mm -hmm. felt of myself like I was a Canadian. Yeah, you know I wanted to go here and tried to go when I was seventeen. They wouldn't let me then. It's a good thing probably in a way, and then. I won when I was 24, but it took me being here till I was 57 that I walked into a store, books on company, uh, actually on right. fourth, Third Avenue, Fourth Avenue, yeah. and that I was standing there looking at a book, uh, Driven to Distraction. I don't know why, but uh, I did, and, uh, and there they were writing about ADHD, and the more I saw of it, then I thought, oh my God, that is me. Yeah. And then it took me probably another five years before I really talked about it because there's stigma attached to it, mental disorder, mm -hmm. potentially. And, uh, you know, and uh, uh, obviously that's not the case now or not being looked at now as such. Uh, and the stigma is more and more disappearing. But I felt I had to write a book about it. And, uh, and I did that. This one came out. Uh, last july i think yeah and i mean it was a great well for me listen it was easier for me to to just uh listen to the audiobook and narrated by you which is pretty yeah. cool but yeah, yeah the, the numbers are staggering you know the amount of people that actually live with this you, yeah they call it a disorder but it shouldn't be called that i think no, right it, so it's a superpower totally and in my mind yeah. uh, absolutely and i think if you can you know harness it and and for you focus the way that you can. I mean, you can do amazing things, right? So, yeah, amazing things. And that's the yeah. whole idea, uh, uh, Garrett, is that, uh, you know, the, I've always been a good writer, even mm -hmm. then when I was struggling through my formal schooling. That yeah. was the, I, I, I just didn't have the attention. I lived in a different world altogether. Right. And going and sitting in a school uh, in, uh, for four years, uh, there was something that I could not do mentally, yeah. physically. 
and uh, you know but uh, so the book has been very very popular uh, as you already indicated the frequency of occurrence much higher mm -hmm. than most people had anticipated for sure and uh, you know the uh, uh, you know so it, it has become uh, you know quite popular the other book that I'm doing right now is coming out actually in uh, July is uh, living uh, or finding your passion uh, living the dream yeah I'm looking forward to it yeah, it's, yeah. it will come out in July and uh, you know yeah. and uh, you know so I'm quite excited about that yeah. I, I'm trying to write a book every year yeah that's awesome <laughs> I, I don't think I could do that that's it seems like a lot of work but yeah, yeah that's amazing but the and then the the following year I'm gonna do another one that is uh, uh, you know living young dying old and living young more or less goes to the issue of uh, how do uh, you stay healthy physically and mentally right. uh, and, and stay healthy physically is, uh, you know, staying in shape and, uh, you know, and, and uh, at least keep your body moving and keep your mind working is so critically important at all ages, you know. Absolutely, yeah, especially in later years though, right? So yeah, you know, and, uh, and, and everything is possible because for yeah. myself, I'm 82 and a half. Yeah, and I I call the uh, the older you get, you have to count the halves too because it's getting closer to whatever <laughs> that. No, I'm just joking. But uh, in any event, uh, yeah. you know, I uh, I'm still training. I'm still uh, competing. I'm going to compete in bodybuilding and physique, and uh, and I'm training for that. Probably go compete in November. Okay. You know, for the 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 uh, provincial level, and then hope to get to the national and the arnolds right yeah and, I, and you were saying you're one of the oldest bodybuilders in north america or something i like that. am That's the oldest phenomenal. competitive uh, yeah. you know uh, bodybuilder in north america Very and, cool. and uh, qualified for the nationals and the arnolds in 2018 right. and then came COVID, but now training again to do it again and why yeah. not yeah no, yeah. that's that's great. I've always been a big advocate for, you know, exercise and, and going to the gym. I try to go there four or five days a week. And I have since I was, geez, I was in high school, maybe 16, 15, I started working out. And I think it's just important. It's good for your mental fitness, right? No question about that. And it's uh, it's just, a, yeah, it gives me that drive. And, and, and in the summertime, I try to go in the morning before work. So I get up at 6 a.m. and and get it out of the way, I say, so that I can do something after work, like go golfing or just enjoy, you know, yeah, being outside. Yeah, and so, some of the friends that I have in, in the area they are very active in, in exercise. Uh, just today, the one fellow that works closely with me, Scott McWalton, I talked to him just today, gave him a phone call. He said, uh, yeah, I just came back from running a half a marathon. <laughs> what? <laughs> you, know, yeah. okay, you know, so but. It doesn't have to necessarily be like me, you know, uh, going to compete or trying to be the uh, oldest competitive bodybuilder in North America, you know, but it's more about staying fit and mm -hmm. healthy and, and keeping your body moving and uh, yeah. it, it's good for your body, obviously, and for your mind. For and sure. then also for, uh, you know, that uh, if, if you become older and still are able to use your body and your mind Mm -hmm. uh, you know, then age just becomes a number. For sure. And and the book that I'm uh, doing, uh, Living Young and uh, Dying Old, really deals with those particular issues. That'll be interesting for sure, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so important being active, right? And uh, fortunate enough as we are here in Prince George, there's a lot to do for activities. Yeah. One thing I actually got into this year, which is surprising, I didn't get into it sooner, but cross-country skiing. So at Caledonia right. Nordic uh, Ski Club there, I just tried it out for the first time this winter. And I mean, we have one of the best facilities in do. North America. Absolutely. Here, right? So yeah. very, very cool sport. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that I got involved in that. Cause you see, that makes this place so and it's so, uh, and simply because you're bringing it up as well. There are so many things to do in and around a city like Prince George, about 80,000 people, it will probably double in size in the next 10, 15, 20 years, I believe. Yeah, yeah. But uh, all around us is uh, nature, lakes. For sure. And, and then all the things that we have here, right behind us is a brand new swimming pool. 
amazing mm -hmm. facility. <laughs> then we have uh, the best small university in Canada here yeah. located. We have the College of New Caledonia and all the other things, maybe cross country skiing, one of the best facilities in North America, mm -hmm. probably right here, and all those other things, you know, then it makes you wonder and it makes me wonder why some people would want to live in these major cities of half a million people in a concrete building yeah. and, and take an hour to drive to work, but I'm not being critical, I'm just saying, you know, take a look around, see what is happening in northern British Columbia. It's the land of opportunity, you know. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I remember growing up here and uh, over where like Superstore is, right? And, and Mr. Mike's. I mean, those used to be ball fields that I played, you know, Little League baseball at, exactly. right? And now it's massive strip malls and grocery stores. And right. so the, the amount of development, especially downtown too, actually, which has yeah. been really neat to see. Yeah. You know, in this town, it's, it's pretty cool, right? Yeah, no, no question about it. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your family. Does your family live in... Prince George as well? Yeah, so my dad's originally from Toronto. My mom's originally from Winnipeg. They both ended up here and uh, met. Why? Uh, so my mom was an RCMP officer. She, okay. She did depot in Regina, and okay. then she got stationed in Prince George. Okay. My dad um, was studying marketing, and he ended up getting a job with the Jim Pattison Broadcast Group. Uh, and he, he worked for Jim Pattison for 36 years selling advertising, Wayne Dobson. Right. Um, just celebrated his 73rd I, I've birthday. I've heard the name. <laughs> yeah. No, I know him quite well. <laughs> quite, a, quite a few people know him just because yeah. he, he was always out and about um, yeah. doing his thing when he was in the business. And uh, yeah, actually just celebrated his 73rd birthday with him yesterday. And yeah. Yeah. And has yeah. been very active in the community and obviously was involved sure. in uh, Mr. Jimmy Patterson's uh, and, the, uh, you know, and uh, so I know him well. Yeah. And has been very, very active in the community. Have you got any siblings at all? Or? Yeah, I've got a brother who's a dentist down in the Kootenays. Okay. Uh, he's got a practice in Nelson. And then my sister, uh, she lives here. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah. Yeah, so it's just, it's nice to be back here and closer to family. Um, you know, when you move away, you just, you, you take for granted everything that you have at home, right? And, yeah. and it's, and when you're, when you're actually not at home anymore for an extended period of time, you start yeah. to miss it, right? And yeah. so, yeah, just the, you know, the friend group that I have here and being closer to family is just so, so big for me, right? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's nice to be back in the community. And then even to just go away for five years and come back and see all the development. I mean, it's, it's yeah. pretty neat, right? To yeah. be part of a community that's growing and developing. So when did you come back? Um, so I, I guess I would say I sort of moved back in September of last year. Okay. Uh, I, I, again, I still split my time, right? I, I, I go to Terrace for a week, uh, a month or so. Yeah. Um, kind of as needed, but spending most of my time here. And yeah, it's just, it's been nice to kind of get back into all the different things and, and yeah. activities, right? Yeah. Uh, started playing pickleball, which is one of these sports that's really up and coming and, yeah. and great exercise. And yeah, there's just, there's a lot to do here, really, if you, yeah. if you actually put yourself out there. So if you look forward, Garrett, uh, you know, saying that uh, you're still a young fellow compared to me <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and, and kind of establish your career at a fairly young age, you know, mm -hmm. which is very important, uh, you know, the, uh, and, and, and probably directly goes to my book, Finding Your Passion, mm -hmm. Living the Dream. And for me, that is, uh, you know, that there are so many people that say, oh, I hate my job. Yeah. You know, and, and that means, I say change. You know, and say, well, mm -hmm. you know, I'm 45 or whatever the case may be, or whatever. Yeah. And saying, well, I'm too old. Well, no. The, everything, if that's how you feel about the work that you do, mm -hmm. and all the time that you spend there, that will affect everything around you. Yeah. And not only you, but also all the other people around you. So, uh, you know, that, and, 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 uh, 
it's very, very important to make those choices and make corrections if you have to, you know, so. Absolutely. I mean, I find myself very fortunate in that I found a career that I absolutely love. It doesn't even feel like I'm going to work every day because I enjoy it so much, right? And I found it early on enough, um, you know, before I was even done university, I actually got licensed to become an advisor. And then as soon as I was done. So the question then is, how did you find that? Yeah, it's a good question, right? Uh, for me, it was a little bit of luck. Um, and so my dad was actually, he's a client of mine and, and my, uh, my business partner now, Ted Brown, um, he was working with him and my dad was in just doing a review of his portfolio and Ted had mentioned that they were looking to hire a junior advisor and my dad just mentioned, well, my son's studying finance up at UNBC, maybe this is something he'd be interested in, right? So he connected the two of us and uh, I met with, uh, with Ted and Steve and uh, we sat around at the boardroom table at the office and talked about the business and the future. How old were you then? Geez, I would have been 20... Two, twenty-three, something so like that. Very young fella. Right? Yeah, just over ten years ago, and yeah. um, and it, it it all just worked out from there, which is pretty cool, right? So I got I got really lucky in that regard, uh, just finding the the right career. But um, yeah, I'll I'll never leave the business. I mean, I, I love it. It's it's a great business to be in. So the point is uh, is this one, Garrett? Is that what I say? Uh, you know, and that's what the book is all about finding your passion and 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 how do you do that well try to get exposure to the different areas that may have your interest mm -hmm. or that you say well you know i like to know more about a business you know or uh you know that uh and and for business people to speak to young people in schools or in university uh, and, and just at that critical time when uh, a younger person makes their choices yeah. and rather than making it by pure coincidence, have it in a more deliberate way that, uh, you know, where we as a community or as, as uh, in a general sense, create those opportunities to interact with people that have made choices in careers but may that be, uh, may they be uh, mechanical, may they be a carpenter, furniture makers, or whatever they may be, so that they get exposure to it and saying, I really like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, you know, just, just thinking about back in high school, I, I was always interested in the stock market and finance somewhat interested me, but I never thought that I would actually end up, you know, where I am today. No. So it's, it's interesting, you know, how life works sometimes, right? Yeah. And again, just the, the luck of my dad meeting with, with Ted at the time and, and getting hired on the way that I did. I was still in university doing a little bit of interning. And then, Perfect time. And then, yeah, and then got licensed. Um, yeah, it was just, it was serendipity, right? And yeah. so, um, and like I say, I'll never leave the business. I, I enjoy it so much. So. Yeah, no, and, and so that's kind of, uh, you know, what the, the book is all about is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, finding your passion because then the job doesn't become a job. It is, uh, you know, something like you do every day. Uh, like yeah. I still feel myself about being in the lumber industry and uh, although there are all kinds of challenges as we all know, uh, yeah. but I always look forward every day to go to my job because that's my dream job. You know, yeah. So, yeah, and it makes a big difference on your life, right? It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, when it doesn't feel like work anymore, it just, it doesn't feel like you're, you know, it's a job, right? So then let's talk about, uh, you know, the financial market. Yeah. You know, obviously, uh, you know, the, uh, there are some problems in the banking side that kind of, uh, you know, so it, it feels mm -hmm. like a bit of a perfect storm. So if I kind of look back from a business perspective, financial market, uh, you know, building businesses, entrepreneurs that looking at their business, where does it go? What will it look like? Then I see behind me two years of COVID-19 mm -hmm. yeah. that kind of changed a lot of things for things that we accepted as being normal. A lot of companies didn't survive it, yeah. you know, because of, uh, and especially the smaller businesses and even some bigger ones. Yeah, then, that's unfortunate, yeah. Yeah, and then 
what followed then is, uh, you know, the global supply chain, all the things that we take for granted. Uh, yeah. How do I, and, and especially if I look at it from our perspective, the rail system where we bring product to market. And I've done this business at my company for 50 years nearly. That was fairly routine to go from Central Base Columbia to North America and particularly into the States. But mm -hmm. all of a sudden that became a major problem because of the global supply chain. Yeah. Everything is connected. The same happened with products that go offshore into China and wherever they may go, container access became extremely difficult. Yeah. Access to people became a major problem. And then obviously the next thing is that an overheated economy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which raised prices and inflation became a real problem at one point was approaching 10% or beyond that, somewhat in talking more or less North America, the United States in particular. Yeah. And uh, hence, that means that governments do not like that way. And so they have to cool it down because it disturbs all the normal cost and it affects a lot of other things. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? Like COVID totally shook up a lot of different things, but one, one thing being the global supply chain. So the definition of inflation is too much money chasing too few goods, right? right? So we saw the supply chain, basically a massive glut in the supply chain. So right. factories shut down and nobody was really producing as much as they were normally before COVID. Right. And there just wasn't enough goods for people to buy, but people had a lot of money because there was a bunch of cash being injected into the market, right? Correct. Uh, central banks were uh, pumping out money and and giving like serb benefits to people so that's and, what and governments were right yeah absolutely so that's what caused prices uh, of of goods and services to go up the way that they did right now to combat that the central banks have raised interest rates and that's right. what we saw happen last year and well into this year so that's hopefully going to bring inflation down and we're starting to see that happen right right but it's an interesting balancing act that the central banks have to play, right? Because as a result of raising interest rates too quickly, they cause things like the Silicon Valley Bank uh, fiasco, right? Yeah. And well, they caused it, I, yeah, I guess they would have caused it. But basically w with the Silicon Valley Bank, what happened was the bank was taking deposit depositors money and they were buying uh, assets with it. Okay. Yeah, so, bonds. Exactly. So, so 10 year treasury bonds, because yeah. those were paying the highest interest fixed, rate. Fixed mortgage rates. Yep, exactly. So, but the problem was they were buying long-term assets to cover short-term liabilities because a, a deposit is a short-term liability for a bank, yeah. right? And when interest rates went up as much as they did last year, it devalued these bonds, right? Yeah. So when all these people said they wanted their money out of the bank, the bank had to sell these these long-term bonds that were worth maybe you know uh, three quarters loss. of what they were originally yeah and that's what caused the problem right but but you know and, and i sometimes look at that as well and saying is that not very elementary how could a bank like that it ever totally do is. that because yeah any financial advisor like yeah. you would have not advised me to take that money and put it into Bonds. Well, exactly right, and it's it's interesting. We have a much different system here in Canada. I think yeah. we're we're quite insulated to this, but yeah. yeah, how were the you know the people running these banks allowed to take that money and invest in something like that? Exactly. The problem with these bonds is they don't get marked to market every day. It's called so so valued every day. So they show on the books as as being worth let's call it a hundred million or a hundred billion dollars, but they're actually only worth seventy five billion. Yeah, and they when they originally bought them they were worth a hundred but because interest rates had gone up they were they were worth less right yeah and so it, the system is a little bit broken it's also some people making some really bad decisions but i don't think it'll impact us as much here in canada so to put it in perspective because i deal all my business virtually is in the states so i tend to 
watch them closer than yeah. I do Canada, but for right. our conversation, we should do both. Yeah. So if I look at Canada, uh, it's, our system is much tighter than the yeah. U.S. would be. And in the U.S., they uh, you know, have 4,000 banks or something like that. Yeah, it's a crazy amount of regional banks. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of them are regional. So that mm -hmm. system is different. Whereby us, and a lot of times we beat up on them mm -hmm. and say the big five this and the big five that, then those are A level banks. And then we have B level lenders right. that uh, are more regional in most cases. Like or, credit unions, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. credit unions. Uh, although they are very solid as well on the restriction and so our bank i think in all the time that uh, that we know about banking only two of them have gone under and the one was in the 30s i think or somewhere around the home home bank mm -hmm. and then the other one was in the 80s northland bank out of calgary right i happen to be a client of them then Oh, geez. So nearly put us out of business. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Overnight, it was saying uh, the bank is gone. Yeah, uh, all our uh, you know assets were in, and our loans were with them, and uh, you know, so not a good experience. But yeah, that's scary. rare in Canada, for sure. In the United States, and just going back to the United States a bit, it looks like uh, let's stay in Canada a little bit here. So what happens then? As the mortgage, or, uh, as the interest rates go up, which is the and, and basically the Fed or the in in the U.S. or the uh, central bank in uh, uh, in Canada putting their foot on the brake to slow down the economy, right? Which is a delicate process because if we do it too fast to slow inflation then it may create deflation, which is equally bad, if not worse. So it's a delicate, deli we seem to do that well in Canada, mm -hmm. because I, I believe, you know better than I do, likely, our inflation rate is down around the 5.2% or so. That's right, yeah. And, and yeah. the ideal would be to see it around two, between 2 and 3 yeah, two is the long-term average, right? So that's, yeah, I think yeah. the target rate is two and a half right now. Yeah. So United States is still a bit higher, a, a slightly over six percent, but mm -hmm. also probably the next adjustments that will go to around the five. Yeah. The reason that I say this, as it then affects us in general, then saying, okay, what is the first thing that usually happens? Mortgage rates go up. Yeah. to where we were having mortgage rates in Canada and all other places that I'll be talking again, Canada at between two and 3%, all mm -hmm. of a sudden it may be at 6%. Mm -hmm. That slows down Yeah, because then people don't qualify anymore. Well, right? exactly right. So anytime interest rates go up, it should curb spending because people don't want to pay that higher interest rate on something right. like a mortgage. So they're, sure. they're not going to buy that house, right? Right. And so that's the whole idea behind raising interest rates is it's going to encourage people to save their money as opposed to spend it, right? right? Which should cool inflation. Right. Yeah. So the way I see it now, Garrett, uh, and I'm looking for our markets, the forest industry, mm -hmm. we have had all kinds of mills shut down, uh, about well in excess of 40 pulp mills and it has created a lot of un unemployment and right. A lot of that is because of not enough fiber, not enough timber at the right cost and all the other things. But what really underlies all of that, the market is all forgiving. If prices go up, they were up as high as $1,500. They've right. fallen by the l price of lumber, have pro fallen by something like 70% mm -hmm. to 30%. And most of the mills are not profitable now. So right. that affects everything as we go through uh, the economic community in, in a way. And so correct me if I am wrong, that if I look forward and it seems that some of the markets are well, 
the inflation rate is coming down to the level that interest rates both in the states and Canada likely will not keep rising. I think Canada rather than adding 25 basis points they haven't uh, they, they state uh, neutral. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, they and stopped their rate hike. Yeah. Cycle. And 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 so it's a soft landing somewhat and then then the next thing that likely will happen and that's really what I wanted to get to is that I always say the lumber market, housing market, leads into a recession is that you see the first one to come out again. Right. And one of the reasons likely is that a lot of people that are looking at, I want to buy a house, but the interest rates are too high, but I can get a variable rate that I can change anything because I'm expecting that the mortgage rates will come down. And if they come down, housing prices will go up. So for me, it's the right time to buy a house. Yeah, I think that the market's definitely cooled, right? And right. and we're starting to see mortgage interest rates actually drop, right? Yeah. So things are starting to sort of balance out a little bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, house prices were so overinflated in, in all markets, yeah. in particular the bigger ones. But I mean, we've seen what prices drop 30% in Toronto markets, right? Yeah, I saw up, that. Yeah. Up to that. So yeah, so I think it's getting back to that time where there is that affordability and and as rates come down which they should eventually yeah. right it'll make it more feasible for people to actually buy that house because they can qualify for that and mortgage. even anticipating going into variable rates mm -hmm. and not locking it in until you know yeah so variable rates are interesting right so right now they're really high and when rates eventually do start to come down they'll they'll of course drop right yeah. so i've always kind of like to lock in a fixed term. Uh, I just like to know what my mortgage payment is at all times. Right. Um, I do actually have a variable rate mortgage, so I am hoping that it, you know, it does come down. And then I'll probably lock in a five-year fixed term. Yeah, at the right rate. Yeah, right. hopefully. I mean, we were getting, you know, I've got a five-year fixed term at 1.81%, which is very low, wow. right? Almost as low as they went. Wow. Um, you could get variable rate mortgages for below 1%, which is, it's like free money, right? Exactly. So, yeah. yeah, but they're, I mean, they're so much higher now. Yeah. So, so the one question a lot of times that I look at is saying that, you know, what we're talking about is th there is a real shortage of shelter for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, right across the board in the States yeah. as well as here. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> you know, th there are not enough rental units around at mm -hmm. affordable prices. And that the ideal thing is usually if able to buy, but you can't buy because the cost would be too high to buy. Yeah. So I would like to see 30 to 50 year mortgages. Yeah, why they could not, push the amortization. Why not 50 year mortgages? Yeah, it's true. They could push the amortization periods out. We can go as long as 30 years right now. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's something they could possibly do for sure. Because at the end of the day, owning the house or not owning the house at one time in life, it used to be, you know, that's that I work every day because I want to own my house. Yeah. Well, now it doesn't mean nothing. Yeah. You know, if you have a mortgage on it or not. But it's important now, can you afford the mortgage? Yeah. And and then and then in some cases the mortgages would be lower, you know, than renting a house. Yeah. So that would do a number of things that would stimulate the economy to build more affordable houses at longer interest rates yeah and uh, uh you know at 50-year mortgages yeah it's definitely something we need right i mean you look at the uh, the immigration numbers from 2022 we we had more than a million people move to canada in 2022 yeah. the increase uh year over year was 2.7 percent as compared to 2021 wow that's a lot of people coming to exactly. canada i think we're just shy of 40 million population right so all of those people that move here they have to live somewhere yeah. right and i, I think exactly. that the, that the government needs to step in and really you know get these affordable housing units built because 
There's yeah. just not enough of them out there. But they're not doing, you know, and who am I? But, uh, well, at least I make an observation. <laughs> it's yeah. saying what I see, if we are sitting here as politicians discussing it, it's saying, okay, how do we do that? Well, we, we want to make sure that people don't have more than one house, and if they have a house that they're not living in, then we're going to nail them, we're going right. to charge them X amount of, you know, that's negative policy. That doesn't work. It's true. And, yeah. and it's, it's uh, you know, it, the fairness of it even could be questioned. Mm -hmm. Lower the mortgage rates. That's the answer. Go to 50-year mortgages. Yeah. And then for sure, at least in my opinion, uh, you know, that then your payments on your mortgage will be lower for than sure. the rent you would pay at something else. And that would take the lack of incentive for people investing sure. in, in Canada in terms of buying property or houses that they want to own, which is a negative policy in my opinion. You know, so. Yeah, I think it's a possible solution for sure. Yeah. It would provide that incentive for people to buy as opposed to rent, right? Because yeah. in most cases, you're right. You know, the, the amount of money somebody's spending on rent for a place, they could probably just buy a house, right? That exactly. could be their mortgage payment. And own it. Yeah. And, and to have a mortgage, uh, what's the difference? You know, why yeah. you don't have to, at one point, uh, you know, that uh, uh, I grew up in, uh, in Holland and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, so it was a different world then, obviously. I'm not talking about the war, but after the war, we are... You didn't have the big stores that we have here. Uh, mm -hmm. You had the smaller stores. You would go down there and you buy X amount of weight and a bag full of sugar or salt or whatever you wanted. And then, then the other thing that you had, you, you had no credit cards. Can you imagine saying, yeah. then, and sometimes what they would do, they would charge you know, the, your account and, and you didn't want to talk to neighbors about it because you wouldn't do it. You know, we always pay for what we, you know, Right. That's a long time gone. You know? It's an interesting yeah, world, right? In, yeah. In comparison to what we have today where everybody just puts everything on credit. Yeah. yeah. Credit card's not good either because you pay 22% of uh, interest. But uh, Yeah, it's a very punitive interest rate on some credit cards. As high as 30%, yeah. I think, right? So, so yeah. as you look forward in, uh, in kind of closing, you know, the, the region that you have chosen to have your home and where you were born mm -hmm. has huge opportunity in my opinion is that uh, it will expand especially i love canada I, that mm -hmm. is and all you have to do is watch tv there is no place in the world yeah better than canada and i love british columbia in particular northern british columbia yeah i agree i think we have everything here in british columbia right we've got the ocean the mountains uh I'll never leave British Columbia, I don't think, yeah. And, and safer in a lot of cases, you know, like if you're thinking in terms of even places where I was born in terms of Holland or yeah. Central Europe right now with the Ukraine and, and all the problems that are going on in, in Asia and in, in Iran and Saudi Arabia and those are the, in all of those places compared to all of them, Africa and different places. There are no better places than where we are, and yeah. especially not in Canada, and especially not in British Columbia and in Northern British Columbia. Then uh, you know we are, and I fly a lot, uh, you know, and uh, and I always sit by the window and I look outside, you know, and I've done that. I've been here now for nearly sixty years. Came mm -hmm. in in nineteen sixty-five, and I look outside the window and I say it's paradise. Yeah, we're very fortunate to live where we live. Absolutely, yeah. I agree. Yeah, and I enjoy and I love being a Canadian and being part of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Garrett, for the interview. Thanks for having me. Good luck. Thanks. Thanks.